Um, thanks for joining. This is Created to Learn, uh, Embracing a Life of Knowledge and Wisdom. Michael uh, is going to be presenting, and I'll be helping out as well. And we really just want to spend some time today uh, looking at scripture and experience about what it means to be created to learn. Uh, what does it mean to be a lifelong learner? And what is God's heart for us to, to be learning and what to learn? Um, I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to have some great conversation questions. So we really want to encourage you, if you're watching with us live, use that chat box, chat box functionality. Um, a couple of times, we're just going to stop and really want to hear from you uh, about some things. And then we have a couple uh, media pieces as well, uh, whether it's video or audio. So we're, we want this to be interactive. We want this to be um, engaging uh, because we know that different people learn differently. And so that's the whole point of this. Uh, Michael is one of my friends and partners here at Grace Snellville. He works with me on the adult team. He does some worship stuff. He does communication stuff. Basically, if you need something done at Grace Snellville, uh, you talk to Michael. So when I told Michael I was looking for a webinar topic and asked him to think about it, he came back with this great idea, and I'm really excited. So, Michael, are you created to learn? Are we created to learn? What is this, buddy? I, I am, and I think you are, and I think we all are. And, you know, this, this idea came out of that conversation that we had. We were just kind of talking about some things that we're doing to care for ourselves, care for our families, and care for our communities during this time. And uh, this just kind of emerged as, as a, good, a good broad topic. You know, it's a, it's, that's, it's a pretty broad topic. People have been asking, well, what are you going to talk about? Well, created to learn. We're going to celebrate learning. But it is a, a broad topic, and, and we don't think that in this webinar we're going to be able to unpack all that there is to know about knowledge and wisdom. But we're going to celebrate learning, and we're going to talk about some ways to sort through so much of the information that's coming our way, right? So think about uh, all the information, uh, just about current events right now that, that's coming our way. You know, what are we seeing? Uh, here are the reasons to wear a mask. Here are the reasons not to wear a mask. Why was quarantine a good idea? What are the reasons we should open up? Who do I trust for thoughtful information about racial inequality? You get the idea. So how do we sort, how do we sort through it all and find knowledge that's worth retaining? And furthermore, how do we turn that knowledge into wisdom? God created us with a brain wired to learn. That's what we believe. And the Apostle Paul says, take every thought captive. And brain scientists tell us, that we retain approximately 10% of what we see. We retain about 30 to 40% of what we see and hear. And about 90%, we retain about 90% of what we see, hear, and do. So hopefully this is going to be a well-rounded hour with your help. And, uh, and we'll include as many of those things as we can so that we can learn some things and retain some things. So first question out of the gate, and you can just respond by waving your hand or, or smiling or nodding. But who, who here on this webinar would say that you've learned something in the last two weeks that you didn't know before? All right, see a couple of hands. Good. Uh, who would say that you've learned something in the last two weeks that's changed your life in a positive way? Yeah. Well, that's good. One quick, quick example for me for learning something significant happened a couple of weekends ago. The, um, my wife, Amy, Amy's my wife's name, uh, we've taken over the responsibility of upkeep on the house that she grew up in. So picture uh, a front yard, you know, single family home, front yard in rural South Georgia, with, and the yard's about the size of a football field and a half, okay? So it's, it's dotted with uh, about a dozen pine trees that are spaced out, and the green grass has just got pine cones laying all over it, okay? So the grass there has, has been needing, is being needing to be cut for several weeks now. And I, I couldn't figure out any other way to get it done other than to do it myself. And so there's two significant things about that. Um, I mentioned the size of, of the, just the front yard, not to, to mention the rest of the yard, but just the size of the front yard uh, being, you know, probably close to two acres. And the other fact is that I only have a push mower, right? 
but even even after a lot of thinking, a lot of trying to figure out another way to do it, I just it just came down to this this one thing. That I, it had to be me, and I had to use the things that I had to do it, and it was going pretty well the first day. Uh, yeah, it it was going to take more than a day. You know, after picking up the pine cones, it took a long time, even of itself. But um, the lawnmower died, right? And I had to uh, try to figure out a way of how to get this thing started and how to keep it going. And I remembered something that I learned in 10th grade. So it was a high school forestry class. And I can't tell you much about that class other than something that the teacher said that just stuck with me. I retained it all these years for some reason. And he said, uh, and, and, and it was about chainsaws. We were learning how to, how to repair and maintain chainsaws. But I thought, you know, I can apply this probably to, to lawnmowers because they're it's similar engine structure. And he said, as a matter of fact, he said, yeah, for any of these, these engines, chainsaws, lawnmowers, all you have to do is remember three things. It needs spark, it needs fuel, and it needs air. If it's not running or if you can't keep it running, it's because it's not getting one of those three things or it's getting too much of one or more of those things, right? So that knowledge and, and a little bit of prayer and patience and deep breathing to calm down got me through the steps that I needed to to get that mower started and to keep it going. And why do I share that? I, I share it because it's a little bit of a funny story to think uh, how I've, I would be successful going into that situation with you know a lot of acres of grass and tiny mower. Um, but mainly I think it illustrates uh, that we get all kinds of information throughout our lives and we retain a lot of it and we, attention, we intentionally apply some of it. But furthermore, we, can all, we can't always predict when we're, when we're going to need some of that knowledge. And also we extend a fair amount of trust in the places and sources that we rely on to get our information. So that gets us to these two questions that we're interested in today. How can we grow an awareness of what we're learning and how can that knowledge be transformed to wisdom? The way we're going to dive into this is by looking at a progression from information to imitation and from imitation to innovation. Okay. So if we put those around uh, those words around a triangle, it gives us a, a really good way to uh, to visualize this 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 flow and this progression, and it also helps us to realize that it's not just a linear thing that we go through one time, right? So I consider myself to be a lifelong learner, and I came across that phrase in my twenties, and it really struck a chord. And I didn't know a lot, but I knew that I loved learning new things, and it was significant to me to see people that were much older than I was at the time and to see them still thriving on learning new things. And I knew I couldn't learn everything over the course of my life, but I trusted that God would lead me to the wisdom I needed. And I believed that following Jesus is about lifelong learning. We're all created to be lifelong learners. God's given us a brain that's wired to learn. So how do you learn best? What kinds of things get you interested? What kind of things get your attention? So this simple graphic, information, imitation, and innovation, it helped things become a little bit more sticky for me. So let's define uh, those words real quickly. So by information, we simply just mean knowledge that's obtained from investigation, study, or instruction. Imitation. What do we mean by that? There's a lot of definitions in the dictionary, dictionary for imitation, but there are two that, that really drew my thoughts towards uh, how we want to define imitation in this context. The act of using something or someone as a model, so that's imitation. But there's another angle that really resonates with me as a musician, because this comes from, uh, from a musical uh, background. And this definition says it's the repetition by one voice of a melody, phrase, or motive stated earlier in a composition by a different voice. So what that means is that you think about an orchestra, there are different instruments in the orchestra. And this idea of imitation is repetition by one instrument from the orchestra, repeating what another instrument has already done. So playing a melody, but playing it in a different voice. So think of it not, not as an echo or just a cheap copy or a cheap imitation, but think of it as a repetition in another voice. And one of the ways that I thought to, to illustrate this is by playing uh, a few seconds of 
handles water music. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just was thinking today that I came across this, um, this music for the first time in a humanities class in college. And I even remember the professor's name. His, his name was Dr. Libby Campbell. There we go. I think if I just play this, Marcus, I think it'll, it'll play. Yeah, it should. Let's check it out. Let's see if you hear this. You should listen to 40 seconds. So what I want you to listen for is that there, you're going to hear two trumpets playing a melody, and then you're going to hear another two different set of horns repeating that melody. Let's listen to this. You guys hear that? Yeah. So hopefully you heard um, what uh, what I was trying to describe in the two instruments playing together a melody, establishing a melody, and then it being repeated by a couple other instruments. So that's that's what we want to think about when we think of imitation. Again, not merely an echo, not uh, not just uh, a, a copy, but a repetition in a different voice. And so that brings us to our our, our third word, innovation. And how we define that is simply by, by just saying the introduction of something new. So another way to think about this, uh, I, I tend to be a visual learner, um, auditory, visual learning. That's the, some of the most effortless ways that I learn. And so I was thinking about uh, this uh, as we were preparing for this, and I was thinking about another way to uh, describe this and another way to attach this in, in a way that might be sticky for some of us. And the picture of a sunflower came came into my mind, and the three the three main parts of the sunflower uh, helped me relate to this idea of information, imitation, and innovation. So, if you think about the green leaves and the green stem, they're like sources of information. They bring in nutrients. They bring in sunlight, information from the sun. They provoke promote photosynthesis. And then think about the, the yellow petals. They show off what the information is providing, right? They show off that something's going on. And then the center of that sunflower, it becomes full of seeds that enable the growth of something new. So knowledge is obtained, there's repetition in a different voice, or in this case, color, showing that something's going on. And then there's something new, there's opportunity for something new that's growing from the inside of that sunflower. So there we have it, information, imitation, and innovation. I've already said that a bunch of times, Marcus, so help us sort out what those words mean. It, it's, thanks for sharing that, uh, Michael. I, I love that idea of the information uh, being imitated and innovated on, because one of the things that we see um, through learning is that there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Uh, specifically, knowing something experientially um, doesn't always equate to being wise. And, and one of the things that I, I love this, this uh, author, Miles Kington, said is that uh, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Uh, wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad, right? Uh, there, there's this... My, 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 my wife and I have two little girls and uh, I, I'm always teaching my, my oldest Ava things and she loves to learn things. She knows a lot for someone her age, but she's not very wise. And, and so there's this idea in information science, information technology that there are different levels, right? There's data and, and, and then on top of data, you can build information and on top of information, you can build knowledge. And, and, and that's true and important, 
but wisdom is this kind of capstone thing. Is this kind of um, taking in all of the data and the information and the knowledge and then knowing what to do with it. Uh, I, I've heard another person put it this way. Um, knowledge is knowing what's right. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do. And, and I think there's a, a, a big difference there. And so, you know, Michael and I, when we were talking, we wanted to kind of frame it up first. What is knowledge? What is information? But we really wanted to root our time, most of the time for the rest of the day in, in, in the scripture, in the word, because a lot of folks, I think, it's my belief, uh, think that the Bible and Jesus is just about how to live a moral life, right? Jesus was a moral teacher. He taught you, you know, the golden rule and, and that's it. But really from the first pages of the Bible, we see this theme emerge out of scripture of knowledge and wisdom and specifically what God has intended for us uh, around knowledge and wisdom and knowing him and, and, and what that means. So uh, we, we, we've been talking about plants, we've been talking about fruit. Um, Michael, I think there's something in the first couple pages about that. Why don't you walk us through a little bit about that? Yeah, so if you, if you start thinking about wisdom, especially in a uh, Christ follower context, you might think of Proverbs, and that's great. Yeah, Proverbs is full of wisdom. Like Marcus is saying, this desire to have the best knowledge, it shows up even at the very beginning of the story. So in the garden, when God has made everything, including human beings, and all of creation, the earth, the sky, everything that we see, everything that we can taste and touch, he made all of these things and he, he put man in it, and he said, this is good. And even after he did that, a question entered in this peaceful life that Adam and Eve were enjoying with God. So if we, if we uh, take a look at Genesis chapter 3, uh, do you remember what the serpent said when he comes on the scene? He challenged the knowledge that Adam and Eve had about what God had said. So listen to what he says. When he asked the woman, this is in Genesis chapter three, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? You hear that little twist of doubt, that challenge to what God had said. And here's the response. Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So did you catch that? Satan challenges the knowledge with new information, right? He's saying that he can offer new information, and it's a lie. God had told Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit of that one tree, because if you do, you will die. Satan challenges God's authority with a false promise of power. Eve considers the new information, and in verse 6, she says, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So at the very beginning of the story, we see a challenge to God's authority, his authority to be the one and the only one who can truly name what's good. And the fall narrative in Genesis 3 is it's about knowledge, wisdom, and authority. Yeah, that's good. And so a, a lot of as we are kind of walking through what it means to be created to learn is, is just really honoring what God has to say about knowledge and about wisdom. And as Michael said, one of the key places you can kind of go to is Proverbs. And I, I sit these two Proverbs side by side because when it was revealed to me and when I got this information, it really changed um, my understanding of what it means to learn and why we should always be striving to learn. So Proverbs 3 uh, tells us right off the bat, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. And then you skip down to verse 18. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. 
those who hold her fast are called blessed. So, I mean, I mean, I just really want to draw attention to this. The scripture is on the one hand putting wisdom and understanding. So that there is something there about knowledge and wisdom and it's, and it's drawing an analogy a, a visual picture, even for, for those that, that learn visually that this is more valuable than money, than silver, than gold. It's, it's so valuable, in fact, that it's, it's drawn on analogy to being a tree of life. And, and when you lay hold of that you, you and hold fast to it, you're blessed. And so what, whatever wisdom is and, and however you get it, once you do get it, it, it is like almost like eating from the tree of life. And, and it goes all the way back to that, that first couple of pages in the Bible of what the tree of life represents. And, and, and then when you go a couple chapters later in Proverbs 9, here again, you get this very interesting um, talk of wisdom in, in the tree where it says, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you are alone will bear it. So again, we just get this picture that wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord, uh, the fear of Yahweh. It's being in, in awe and amazement in total um, capture of God. And, and he is the one that, that gives you the knowledge. And it talks about there in verse 10, in knowledge of the Holy One. And if you start with wisdom and knowledge there, then the proverb is that generally speaking, your days are going to be multiplied and years are going to be added to your life and that you will become wise. And so with that, uh, we, we want to take a space to pause and ask you this question. So go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Has there been a time in your life where you had to choose between God's wisdom and what seemed good in your own eyes? What was the outcome? Now, if you'd be comfortable sharing um, about that in the chat, then uh, we invite you to, to write something there. But we're really just, even if um, there's not a visible response in the chat, we want to take a little bit of time just to re reflect. So it may feel awkward with that space, but we want to leave some space to ask that question and wrestle with it a little bit. Has there been a time in your life where you had to choose between God's wisdom and what seemed good in your own eyes? And what was the outcome? Yeah, as people are kind of processing that question, uh, I'll, I'll just share for me. Um, oftentimes, Amanda, my wife and I have had to make decisions about career um, that just run counter to what we're told here in, in America about the idea that the best job is the one that pays the most or gives you the most power or the most influence. And um, part of us moving back home to Georgia several years ago was giving up um, security in our jobs and giving up maybe higher salaries than and coming back home to where we didn't know if there were going to be jobs or what, what it was going to be. And we were doing that in the middle of having our second kid. And it was just, a lot of questions from our family, from our friends about, is this smart? Is, is this what you sh should be doing? And our response was just kind of, we prayed on it. Um, we discerned on it. We fasted on it. We went to God on it. And God said, I want you to move home eight months pregnant with your second kid. And I'm going to take care of everything else. And uh, it, 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 was, it has been a wild ride. But that is just one example that I, I just always kind of go to. Um, it, it's, it's been a time where God has really answered, um, in his wisdom, even though it didn't seem right to us. Yeah. Real quick. So how, do, how do we get this wisdom? What, what, what is that, man? Well, uh, real quick, I was just going to share from, from my life, my Amy and I, uh, about a year into our marriage, we were living in an apartment in Decatur and we wanted to buy a house. And so we prayed about it and, we uh, kind of our posture in prayer was, God, maybe um, you're very open handed with us about where we move to and where we would live. But we want to uh, we want to give this choice to you and just see if there's anything that you are saying about it. And so we we felt uh, like God was leading us to move into a neighborhood in Atlanta. And 
some of our friends and family didn't really understand why we would be moving into a neighborhood where there were a lot of people that didn't look like us. And uh, so that was a, a, a time where we leaned very heavily into the things that God was saying to us. And we, uh, we were trying not to, to let some of those other voices um, call that too much into question. And, and we found some wisdom in that decision. And, and uh, we're glad that we made that decision later on. But yeah, that, that kind of gets us into this question of, of how we get wisdom. So if we know that we're lifelong learners and we know that God is who we can trust to give us wisdom, then how do we receive it? This, is, this definition of wisdom has been with me for a really long time, and, and I love it because it's just so simple. We get wisdom by applying what we know. We get wisdom by using the knowledge that we have. So if we think about those, those yellow petals on the sunflower, we think about that uh, imitation spot on that, that triangle, then, uh, then, then that's where we're getting at with this, that we're, we're beginning to put into practice the things that, that we have as knowledge. And uh, uh, something that I like to, a way that this is sticky for me is just remembering, show what you know. Think about the sunflower that's showing off that there's something going on. So show what you know, those yellow petals. Um, so, yeah, it also kind of applies to that story that I shared earlier, even as silly as it may be. But I know that chainsaw engines need spark, air, and fuel. And, and when I applied that to the lawnmower, I got some useful wisdom now that helped me in that moment and it helps me moving forward. So we're, we're learners. And that's been one of the values at Grace here for a long time. And the way that we've defined that here is we're learners hearing God's word and doing what he says. What are some other words for, for learner? There's apprentice and disciple. You know, that word that we, that we say a lot, we use a lot around at Grace, disciple, it means learner. So here's what the late professor and theologian Dallas Willard says about being a disciple, an apprentice, or, or a learner. He says, a disciple is someone who has decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become capable of what that person does or to become what that person is. So think about uh, times when you've intentionally sought out another person because you wanted to gain what that person had. That's what uh, this definition of a disciple is from Dallas Willard. You decide to be with another person because you want to get something that that person has or become what they are. And then he goes on to say that a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus in particular is anyone who is learning from him, who's learning from Jesus, how to lead their life as he would lead their life if he were they. Now, it's a, it's a simple definition, but it can be uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit tricky to get a hold of. But think of it in this way. If Jesus had your life, if he had your spouse, if Jesus had your job, had your vocation, he had your, your talents, your gifts, your skills, how, how would he live? So that's what that means, being an apprentice of Jesus is anyone who's learning from him how to lead their life as he would live their life if he were they. And then the good news is you can be a lifelong learner of Jesus right where you are. That sounds easy, right? Uh, but uh, most of us know, uh, if we've been trying to follow Jesus for a while, that that there can be times when we're not always sure how to apply or when to apply the things that we know. So let's look at some of the things that Jesus says, and uh, they'll give us hopefully some insight into this as a process, right? So Luke chapter five, verses 33 through 35, Jesus says, John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating bread or drinking wine, and you say, he's possessed by a demon. The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom 
is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. So for some that were, were watching Jesus, they, they were relying on another point of view, and they saw the way that, that he was living in, in this moment like he's describing. But Jesus tells them, you'll see wisdom coming out because you're going to see lives being changed. So the people that are following in, in my footsteps are going to show what real wisdom is. So what are some other ways that, um, that it can be a little challenging to know uh, what to apply and when to apply it? Um, I was thinking about a couple of passages in Matthew. Uh, one of these passages, Matthew 6, 3, Jesus is talking about um, giving gifts to the needy, and he says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Well, just before that, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So these things don't contradict each other, but unless you're side by side with Jesus, learning from him, trying to follow his ways, it might be difficult to know what he's talking about, what to apply and when to apply it. So as you're walking with Jesus, you begin to see that what he's talking about in, in, in Matthew 6 is specifically when giving gifts to the needy. And then what he's talking about in Matthew 5 is not being ashamed to proclaim this new spiritual kingdom that Jesus is announcing and to not hide what you know. Let people see that wisdom coming out in your life like he was talking about in that Luke passage. So knowledge of these teachings from Jesus is great. And the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how of applying the knowledge, it's the process of gaining wisdom. So it's, we apply ourselves to that process. And while it can be hard at times to know what knowledge to apply and when to apply it, um, Yeah, even, even Solomon was thought of as the wisest man in history, and, and certainly his wisdom was a gift from God. But Jesus talked about a spiritual wisdom that he was ushering in. So it's really helpful to begin to think of this in terms of what is Jesus saying that the kingdom is like that he's bringing in? And what is this wisdom that is beginning to come out? Well, let's look at how Jesus handles this with Nicodemus. So um, John chapter 3 there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So setting the scene a little bit, Nicodemus, he's a respected religious leader. And he's seen maybe firsthand, but he's at least heard about these miraculous signs that Jesus is doing. And so he's drawn in. He, he's, he's gained some knowledge about what Jesus uh, has been doing. Uh, and a really great um, portrayal of this has recently come out in this series called The Chosen. So I'm going to attempt to show this. And, uh, and this maybe will help us get a good picture of this scene between Jesus and Nicodemus. Have you come here to show us a kingdom? That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean like a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? <sighs> I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How 
can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things, huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind? How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear its sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize his effect. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that. I love that scene. I don't think that's so well portrayed by those actors. And yeah, they took some liberty in license, but what we get from that is we can see that Nicodemus, he has a great deal of knowledge. And Jesus was asking him to stretch his understanding and receive this new spiritual kingdom. Nicodemus believed because of the miracles, but he had a position and respect. So it was difficult for him to see himself applying this new understanding. For us to look into this conversation, we're probably reminded of the ways that the Holy Spirit has shown his effects in our lives. But we may also be drawn to the honesty of Nicodemus and be aware of some knowledge in our own lives that's yet to become applied and proven as wisdom. So that leads us to this question. As Christians, we believe Jesus teaches us how to live in the kingdom of God. What is one strength and one weakness you have with following Jesus well? Let's take a, a second and reflect on that question. We yeah. believe Jesus teaches us how to live in the kingdom of God. What's one strength and one weakness you have with following Jesus well? I, I think that's such a good question, man. And I, as people are kind of processing that and, and thinking about Nicodemus, I, I know one thing that's been helpful for me as a follower and a, and a learner is maybe when I was younger and my understanding of the Bible was less mature, I, I would read, you know, the Pharisees and, and all these other people, these, these lawyers, and be like, oh, they were just stupid. Like, they, they, how could they not know? Like, the living God was with them. Like, they just couldn't understand. And, and it, it's helpful for me to remember and humble myself that these were really learned people, right? Like, they knew the Torah back and forth. They knew the Jewish law. They knew all the costs all the customs. It, it wasn't a question of knowledge, right? It's not a question of having the right information or the right data. It, it's really something about the heart and wisdom that, that God kind of is looking for. And that's why I love this question here. What is one strength and one weakness you have with following Jesus? Well, I would just really encourage you if you're on the watching with us live today, or you're watching this on the replay later, um, to just take some time tonight before you go to bed or maybe in the morning when you wake up or wherever that quiet time is, if you're walking with your family, turn to your spouse or your partner, turn to your kids even, and just ask them, um, you know, what's a strength you have? Because God gave you strengths and, and what's a weakness? Because we're all dealing with sin and weakness that you have with following Jesus well. And, and, and I think that's just such a very important question. We see Nicodemus in that scene struggling with you know what does it mean to be born again you know what i mean it's just it is a lifelong wrestling that we have to do as jesus followers because um the teachings uh, may not be complicated but it is hard to follow if you don't have a heart for it so yeah it's good stuff so um michael talked about being a lifelong learner i, I just want to 
turn that on, on its head a little bit or is the diamond the, 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 another facet of it? And what does that look like to be a continuous learner, right? How do we do this continuously? And, and I think uh, like most things, as I've gotten older, I've learned the, the Bible has an answer, or at least it, it, it points you in the direction. And this verse from Matthew, I think, is just so incredible, Matthew 13. It is like a diamond. It has many facets. You can turn it over and over and see different things in it. But what he, what he says here in Matthew 13, 10 through 12, as he's talking to his disciples is, uh, the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Uh, so why is it so confusing, confounding? What are you doing here? And it's one of the few times where Jesus gives like a straight answer to the people to let them know. And he says, uh, Jesus answered them, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. For to the one who has more will be given and he will have an abundance, but from the one who is not, even what he has will be taken away. So again, just going back to this theme over and over, we really want to develop it for you today. This idea of, uh, to you has been given to know the secrets. The kingdom of heaven and following Jesus is about knowledge. I, I don't know how else to put it to you, but knowing God, having that relationship with him, um, it, it, it is the, the key here. And, and, and Jesus is telling his, his followers right here that, you know, I have given, Jesus has given, not, you haven't merited it, you haven't earned it, you haven't gone out there and done enough good deeds, and now you get this secret treasure. It's given, right? And, and we will later find out it's given by a, an act of grace. And so it's just so important to us as lifelong learners, that, that people that are continuously learning, that yes, you do have to seek it. You, you can seek it. You, you should be seeking Jesus and, and God and, and the Holy Spirit, but also that this knowledge and these secrets of the kingdom of heaven are given and they're given by a good and gracious father and, and they're given freely. So th that, that's important because what we see as this theme is developed later on in the New Testament, um, specifically here in Second Peter, and as the, the, the apostles and the early church are trying to wrestle with, what does it mean to be a Christian? Like, what does it mean to follow Jesus? He's, he's died on the cross. He's been resurrected. He's ascended. Now we're meeting in these small groups where we're meeting in homes. We're meeting. We're looking at scripture. What does it mean to follow Jesus and, and, and to follow Jesus well? And what we see in this scripture here in 2 Peter 1 um, is, is that, it says his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So again, even just going back to what we talked about on page three of the Bible or looking at Proverbs, there is something about knowledge and not just knowledge, but knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. That if you look in second Peter, it's like, it's almost like a math equation, right? You get something on one side of the equal sign and you get something on the other through the knowledge of him what you get on the other side, and it says, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. And, and that just calls us right back to that image of the fruit of the tree of life, right? That if, if we have this divine knowledge and wisdom, we get to partake in the divine nature. We, we get this opportunity to escape the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So I, I, I want to end this continuous learning thing here. And I, I just want to land the plane in this last verse here in Second Peter, because I, I think it really does a great job of painting what it looks like for us as Jesus followers or people that are coming to follow Jesus and know Jesus um, through knowledge and wisdom. How do we embrace a life of knowledge and wisdom? And Second Peter really has a really good framework for us where it says, uh, in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. So you have faith, you add virtue. 
in to virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ and i just think that paints such a beautiful word picture there and again you see that word knowledge twice i mean it's, it's multiple times in there but really if you're thinking of it as a pyramid at the base of your pyramid is faith faith in jesus christ the messiah the son of god and who he is as god and then on top of that faith you you, you will add virtue if you have that faith but on top of that virtue is knowledge and, and that knowledge is important because as you increase knowledge and increase, and as Michael talked about, knowledge and wisdom from following Jesus, you learn more self-control. And as you get more self-control, you become more steadfast in your nature and in your face. It, grow, it grows stronger. And the more steadfast we are building our lives on the rock of Jesus, the more godliness we get, and the more godliness and closer to God in relationship we are, the more we can love our neighbors, love people in our neighborhoods, and uh, with that brotherly affection, it, it kind of ends there with love. And, and we know what love is. And John talks about love a lot. So I, I, I just want to kind of bring it back to that because then in, in this verse, it ends that if you have all these things in increasing nature, if you're a continuous learner, if you're a lifelong learner, and you're building out in this way, it will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in what? In the knowledge, right? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so whether you're on page three of the Bible or you're all the way at the end of the New Testament looking in the letters, the theme that emerges is that God has created us to be in relationship with him, to learn from him, to gain knowledge from him, to get wisdom from him so that we can have a full life, uh, that, that fruit from the tree of life. So that, and, and we should embrace that uh, as, as followers of Jesus. We shouldn't run from knowledge, right? We shouldn't run from science. We shouldn't run from facts. We should be running to those because we know that God created everything and he created it good. And, and so we shouldn't be afraid of the truth ever. We shouldn't be afraid of facts ever. We shouldn't be afraid of knowledge. What we should be afraid of, what we should have fear of, is fear of the Lord, right? That's the beginning of wisdom, just going back to Proverbs. And again, I'm just borrowing that straight from Scripture. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so, just like Michael said, we're always going to be confronted with new information. Some of it's going to be from the enemy, but we have to fall back on the knowledge we've gained from walking with Jesus. And that kind of leads us out to our last question, and, and uh, I'll just leave it there. Um, where are you currently in regards to information, imitation, and innovation? Uh, where's your opportunity to increase? So like Michael, just with that last question, what should we be taking from that question? Well, you know, uh, we're in an interesting time, right? But wisdom is, is as relevant as ever, and learning doesn't stop even in, in times like this. And uh, the opportunity for something new for a new understanding, for something uh, new to, to be moving through us as followers of Jesus, it, there's opportunities for that right now. So uh, wherever we might be on that imitation, innovation, I'm sorry, imitation, information, it's a lot of eyes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Information, imitation, and innovation, where we might picture ourselves on that, that triangle, or if we think about the sunflower image again, uh, with are we in a season where God's inviting us into uh, holding up the information that, that we're getting to him? Is he ask, is inviting us into finding some, uh, some direction and where we're getting information from? Is he inviting us into, uh, what is he inviting us into imitating? What is he inviting us into show? You know, there may be some knowledge that we have that's really needed to be shown right now. And then what are some, maybe some new things that could grow out of this season that uh, that when we when things begin to to reopen and as things begin to 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 shift back you know, what are some new things that even have begun now that will continue to to grow and and uh, and be produced in the season ahead so yeah where where are you in regards to that information imitation innovation which of those things do you do well 
one of the things that I find myself <laughs> saying um, sometimes to our kids as we're homeschooling is it's important not to try to go right from information to innovation. That's skipping a step, right? And it's important uh, not to just stay with information. It's important not to just sit there and be stagnant with the information. We need to put it to use. We need to show that we're learning um, because that it doesn't just show other people. It shows, uh, it helps us to see what we're learning to, to be uh, showing those, those values to be uh, giving flesh to that information. And then furthermore, we don't want to just be um, repeating, even though repeating in a different voice is good. God wants us to, to grow and bring our uniqueness um, to the world. So that's where that information, that innovation stage can shine. But then we go right back to it. It's, it's, a, it's a continuous thing, like we've been saying. So uh, it's a good question to just sort of ponder right now. Where am I? Where, what's God saying to me about information? Who am I trusting? Am I looking at information through his authority? Imitation, what's God saying to me about that, perhaps, or innovation? Yeah. Where's our opportunity to increase in wisdom right now? And, and the way I would put a bow on it, uh, and very similar, is just, um, again, from the third page of the Bible to right now in my life and in your life, every day we're faced with the question of, what are we going to do when we make a choice, right? Every day we sit before choices and we have two options. Really, it's not that complex. It boils down to, are we going to do things on our own knowledge and what we believe to be good or, or bad, or are we going to listen to the wisdom of God, right? Um, as Jesus followers, we have this, this great um, blessing of the cross and the, the scripture that points us to Jesus and who he is and, and how we can imitate him. And we have information from the Bible. We have a way to imitate in the Bible. And then we have the Great Commission, which tells us at the very end to go and teach and preach, right? Be innovative. Go take this information, take my life that I've modeled, and go out and do it yourself. And so we just want to continue to work around the triangle um, day in and day out. And it, it goes back to even the Lord's prayer where it's, you know, your will be done. Um, how do we do that? We, we, we use knowledge, we use wisdom, we use discernment, we use prayer. And hopefully, um, Michael and I have having talked to you guys for an hour have, have helped you see that 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 is fruit from the tree of life that that is what God is calling us into um, being continuous learners lifelong learners you've been created for it so um, go do it we love that we love that yeah I had this here I, I always like finding in the chat box I always like finding someone in my life that is doing something that I want to learn from I love imitation and then learning how I do it uh, through who God created me to be. That's exactly right. Um, it, yeah. It's if you, you can find someone to get information from or imitate and then innovate on that, that, that that's how we do it. Michael, any other final thoughts there before, before we close it out? Um, no, I, 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 I'm just excited to see what God's doing in our community. I know that there are lifelong learners in this community. So I'm excited to see, the innovations that are coming out of the season and just thank you guys for for being here with us to to discuss this today i know it's a broad topic we didn't we didn't uh unpack the whole scope of wisdom that's not necessarily our intent but hopefully it's been an encouragement to wherever you are today that just to remember that god's got wisdom for us today all right thanks guys take care have a good day